Hey guys, James Wilson Taylor here for Rock Sound. This is the latest of our video calls. We've been chatting with everybody while we're all kind of stuck at home at the minute. I'm delighted to say our guest today is the one and only Mikey Way. How are you, man? Hello. How's it going, James? Yeah, not bad, man. Not bad. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. And we'll start this out in the way we've started every single one of these, which is to, of course, say, hope you, hope oh. your loved ones, all that stuff. You're, you're staying safe, staying well in these very, very strange times we find ourselves in. Uh, and before we get into music, I suppose, just how has this kind of extended time been at home for you, man? How have you been occupying yourself these months? I think, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's gone as well as it can go for anyone, I guess. I mean, I just kind of, I got a big chunk with my family that I didn't think I was going to have because I was supposed to be on the road for a good chunk of time. So I kind of, I was gifted like this little pocket of, of family time, which has been amazing. You know, I have, I have two little girls, so I was able to see some awesome milestones. You know what I mean? That I, I would have seen over FaceTime. So I would have been in some other country, you know what I mean? So I think if, if, if I wanted to frame it in a positive light, that's my positive light. Oh, you've got to find the positives in there. And that's definitely a huge one. Of course it is. And, uh, and then I guess on the creative side, you've been keeping busy, which is very exciting. I, I think for, for most people like me, it's if, if you're not creating something, you start to go downhill. You know what I mean? It's nice to be able to uh, actually, I guess, keep working from home as well. I mean, talk to me about the beginnings of this because, uh, you know, it is the new album from Electric Century. I suppose the first question would actually be why now? It has been a minute since the last record. Was this a lockdown project for you or were you already plotting about a return to, to this musical endeavor? What's, what's interesting about Electric Century is it's almost the perfect project for like a lockdown experience, but we were working on it when it wasn't a lockdown experience. But... We were, if this makes sense, we were working on it as if it were a lockdown experience because me and Dave weren't on the same, weren't in the same room almost. We've, we've rarely been in the same room when making this project, which is, it makes it a little uh, unique in that respect. But um, it's been something we, we've, I think we've been working on this since, I mean, we've been working on it since the day after the last one came out. Even in some respects, we've been working on it while the last one was out or being made even. Cause some of these songs were slivers of songs that I think we had on for the night to control. But um, me and Dave kind of have this, this fluid open uh, bridge where he kind of just sends me demos all the time. And I kind of like, I kind of stockpile them and I kind of go through them and, and sifting or like, I'll send him an idea and he'll run with it. You know what I mean? But but yeah, it's mostly like the, the volume that comes from Dave is it's vast, you know, like he's he's a prolific songwriter. So um, which I mean, it's great for me. Um, you know, it gives me a lot to choose from when uh, when plotting out an album or a project. You know what I mean? Like he's he's always sending me, uh, hey, check this out. Hey, check this out. Hey, check this out. You know what I mean? And it's like it's it, it's a good it's like a cornucopia for me, you know, to be able to uh, to choose from. Yeah, you definitely want a lot to work with there. And before we get into the kind of exacts of the music, I guess the first thing that leapt out to me just, just listening to this for the first couple of times is um, actually the title. It's, a, it's almost a cliched question for me at this point because I'm fascinated by album titles, particularly when you go for a self-titled. It's always a bold statement when a band does that, right? Yeah. What made you decide that this was the moment to go, actually, yeah, this is Electric Century? What's, what's, what's funny about this is usually with my projects, I would always have the album title would almost come like really quickly. You know what I mean? Right. Or even, even when I, when I title anything I'm doing it, the, the title comes quickly and this one wasn't. And I was like, I, I would write a bunch down and I'd be like, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. Nothing hit me in the throat. Um, but as the project went on and the, the, the graphic novel kind of grew i was like well this is kind of just electric century because we were kind of introducing the reader to this world that's called electric century and i was like wait that's kind of cool like the concept kind of hit me by surprise where i was like oh wait you know what i mean i'm like that is the album title you know i kind of had that that light bulb moment where i'm like no this is this is self-titled, which is, you know, like it should have been reversed, maybe, you know, people, people, they go with self-titled usually first, you know what I mean? But um, yeah, this one, uh, this one crept up as a self-titled. It didn't, yeah. I didn't intend it to be, but I was like, you can't call it anything else but Electric Century. 
<laughs> it's a definitive yep. statement. It's right. Well, there's there. like, you know, I had ideas of like, you know, like old sci-fi, like into the electric century, beyond the electric century, you know, bride of the electric century, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. But the the stuff I was coming up with, it wasn't hitting me like things normally hit me. You know what I mean? So I was like, you know, for instance, like Electric Century, I came up with it in seventh grade in science class. I wrote it on a notebook. You know what I mean? And it's just like, you know, and it just stuck with me. It's like one of those things like it's stuck with me. I still remember writing it on, you know, you would you would you would cover uh, you would cover books with uh, like a like a shopping bag. You know what I'm saying? Like the paper bag, you cover your science book. Oh yeah, the brown paper. The brown yeah. paper, you have to cover it up, yeah. Yeah, and I plaster it with like Smashing Pumpkins, Nine Inch Nails, and you know, then you dream up your own band names and you draw your own band names. And and I remember writing Electric Century down and being like, I gotta use that someday. You know what I mean? So it kinda, so it kinda came from that. Yeah, when you got one that works, you may as well stick with it, right? It makes a yeah, lot of yeah. sense. Um, Make it work was, for as long as yeah, possible. I, yeah, I thought, um, some something always struck me about that phrase. I know it's a historical phrase. Something always struck me about it, and nobody had used it. So I was like, yeah. I was shocked that nobody had used it for. I think you know, in, in this respect, nobody's ever used it. Maybe there's a company called Electric Century that does something. You know what I mean? Hey, you've got it now. You've got it now. You got the control. You're all good. It's there. It's done. I just, I just, I just threw a bunch of red flags at lawyers right now. <laughs> yeah, cut that bit. Cut that bit. We'll be yeah, this mic, you guys. <laughs> taking our brand now um but it's it's funny isn't it that like it, it when you get you say that it kind of came later in the process titling it that and yeah. making this kind of definitive statement because i guess i want to almost go back to look forward a little bit because like i said it's been a minute since that first record um it's quite interesting to hear you say that there are almost some ideas from the first time around that have made it onto this record as well what would the kind of learning process is looking back on when you did that first record that because I know you've already said you wanted this to be a bit more ambitious. You want it to be bigger. I think it definitely achieves that. It definitely says, sounds a lot bigger, definitely progresses that sound a lot more. But what were the learning points from the first record going into this new one? From the first one, I mean, I think with, with anything, as far as anything musically I do, I think I get better at song arrangement every time. You know what I mean? It's the nature I of it, mean, isn't it? I, yeah, I mean, I learned a great deal from my experience in, in my other band. And when we were recording, you know, I kind of like, you know, I was surrounded by geniuses in my, you know, to me, surrounded by geniuses through and through, you know, if it's band members, if it's producers, if it's engineers, if it's guitar techs, these were people I all looked up to. And I learned a little bit from each of them, you know what I mean? And it's like, I kind of carried it over into Electric Century where I'm, I'm fascinated by song structure, you know, I, I try to, it's almost like, like the concept of Twitter is how to make something cool. It was at one point how to make something cool in 140 characters. I'm in the school of thought where I'm like, I dig when you can hit somebody in three minutes. You know what I mean? Like two minutes, 45, three minutes. And you, you know, like I want to tell a powerful, shorter story usually with songs, but I love to get indulgent here and there. And, you know, as, as you'll notice on, on this self-title album, there's moments of the, the big sweeping, you know, like lots of sections, but then I, I like to throw in the concise, shorter song, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's funny, like the whole thing definitely feels bigger and tied into that. Of course, there's an accompanying graphic novel this time. And you're creating a world, you just said it yourself, you know, you're creating a world very much with this record. I wonder initially, when it comes to that accompanying story that you're creating, how much of that is there and set in stone when you're writing the music or are you discovering them both at the same time? How did it kind of fit together mechanically for you? It's interesting for on the first album for the night to control, I was world building, but you would never know it. You know what I mean? Right. It was kind of a lot of that album was like kind of a journey of what I was going through in that mysterious time in my life. Um, but I was kind of like, you know, it's veiled with fiction, which is, it's what I like to do. I like to mix fiction with my real life you know and i feel like um but you couldn't see it in for the night to control because there was nothing accompany accompanying it there was no videos there was no real visuals you know in fact there was only ever like there was very minimal photo shoots from it everyone used this one shot that i shot in dave's backyard like that was the shot that everybody used like i had a big park on like everyone used that shot and it's like it's really strange to think about that it's like never played a show 
you know, like we somehow got um, some magazine covers out of it, which was, was touching, you know what I mean? Like I, uh, I was moved by that, you know what I mean? Cause it felt like um, I had done something that impacted people. Um, so I thought that was really cool. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's interesting to watch it grow and grow and grow. And, and speaking of the, you know, the graphic novel aspect to it, uh, I guess the initial thing, I mean, it's all very secretive at the minute, which is what we like, and I'm sure it will all reveal itself in time. But what we do know is the setting seems to be largely 1980s Atlantic City. Now, that's not a million miles away from where you grew up, of course. I yeah. take it, is this a lot of personal experience being brought into that particular setting? I I, I was always, uh, I mean, everyone kind of romanticizes about when they grew up. I'm an right, 80s sure. kid. I'm an 80s kid, so uh, I tend to romanticize about the 1980s. I, I personally think some of the greatest movies came from that time. You know what I mean? Like, look at 1987. Go to IMDb. Type in 1987. What was in the water in 1987 or 86 when they were shooting some of this stuff? You know what I mean? Like, like there's just like lightning in a bottle left and right. Um, but again, anyone could say the same about whatever era they grew up in. You know what I mean? But for me um that like 84 to 88 was like bulletproof in my mind you know what I mean so it's like um you know I kind of romanticized about that era but in in the 80s and 90s um me and my family kind of spent time in Atlantic City during the summers but I like to I like to tie it into the old concept of you know the good old days were they really that good? You know what I mean? That's, that's, that's kind of the thought I started to get on was like, Hey, if, if you were able to walk into 1987, what would you think? Would you be like, yo, this sucks. Like, get me out of here. That's kind of, that's kind of like the question I was asking myself when the idea kind of came about where I was like, was it great? I don't know. I think it was great. You know what I mean? I was just kind of like, it was probably great. You know what I mean? It's like, I can't tell for sure, but the grass is always greener on the other side, which I love that concept where your perception's reality and you think what you don't have is really great, but was it, you know what I mean? Like, I love, I love uh, mind benders like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. That lens of nostalgia that we all look through, right? We all love the good old days, but were they, you know, you were always wishing you were here, man. You were, you, you want to be in the future in 2021, with flying cars, the Jetsons, you know what I mean? Oh, little did we know. Little did we know what was waiting, right? <laughs> little did we know, but we tend to romanticize about, about that kind of thing. You know what I mean? So the concept yeah. came from that and it came from, you know, I, I'm a big, I'm a big mental health guy. And and I, I think therapy's amazing, but there's different types of therapy, one of which is hypnotherapy, which I've tried once or twice. And I find it fascinating. And, and when I did hypnotherapy, I was like, this is like a horror movie. And I was like, this would make a good horror movie. Like I kind of like my mind started after those sessions, I was kind of like, this would kind of be, this would kind of be cool. And I kind of like the, the idea spiraled from there where it was like, where it was like hypnotherapy gone wrong. You know what I mean? That's, yeah. that's kind of where the story goes. Yes. There's, there's pieces of, of, you know, like, I always like to say that Dave, his voice is very New Jersey, you know, it's very, it's very, you hear him and you're like, it, it, it's undeniably New Jersey. So I always, with this album, especially like, I was like, I want to make this a New Jersey album, you know what I mean? And, and, and I feel like we succeed in that respect, but I feel like in the graphic novel, there's things that people from New Jersey will, will identify with, even though I don't live there anymore. I'll always like, it's a piece of it, you know, piece no, of it. With of course. It. Well, definitely. It seems like a love letter to your youth, particularly with that 80s setting. And then, you know, you mentioned the 1980s, obviously, and all that, that, you know, dipped in nostalgia, this record, particularly in the sound of it, of course, you know, a lot of that synth pop sound and a lot of kind of, I feel to my ear anyway, a lot of that kind of UK influence that came out of that time. I mean, they really, you know, British bands, shout out, you led the way in terms of that synth wave, that, that kind of real interesting sound around the 1980s. I take it that must have been a big influence here as well, right? It's the stuff it was creeping on the radio when I was a kid, you know, like the, the British new wave was all over the radio when I was a kid. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, it was mixed with what people call yacht rock now, which is like adult contemporary. So it was like adult contemporary mixed with eighties new wave. And I loved it all, you know what I mean? But, but I always like, you know, like you were saying, like the British influence, like when a lot of kids were super into grunge, I was into Britpop, you know what I mean? Like me and my brother, 
that's what we were, that was our thing. You know what I mean? Like somebody was like, what's your big four? You know, my, my buddy, my buddy did on his Instagram. He was like, what's your big four? And I was like, blur Oasis, pulp the verb. You know what I mean? That'd be my big four concert, you know, the big four. It, there's something about British culture and British music that it always screamed to me. And I know it screams to my brother too. And I know we grew up in a house five feet apart at all times, you know? So it's like, Something happened to us at that age where the UK, the UK spoke to us, you know, like even like, you know, like Danger Mouse and Duckula and, you know, uh, you know, like uh, there was tons of British comedies on in the young ones, you know, stuff like that was like, it was, it, it would creep its way onto our television and we'd be like, whoa, this is super cool. You know, it's kind of tongue in cheek, like Benny Hill it was there and, and, and we loved it, but yeah, it also lended itself to, to all the British music that was invading America at the time. So funny to hear you say that we did one of these uh, conversations for the magazine recently with, uh, with Frank Iero and he actually, so I asked him about, um, cause I, I hear a lot of UK bands on his recent yep. EP as well. Yep. And he said exactly that. He was like, you know, what was weird. It was uh, Mikey and Gerard were introducing me to all these UK bands back in the day. He was like, Britpop was their thing. And they, you clearly brought it into there as well. You know, you know what it was? It was like, we, when we toured in my cam in the van, the CD books, like people, people now who, who tour are like, oh, oh, it's all here. And, uh, uh, well, you want a hundred million albums are here. No, CD book, 50 pounds. Um, easy, you know, you scratch the crap out of all of them. Um, but I would, you know, I introduced a lot of stuff to a lot of people in the, uh, the band and they did the same for me. You know what I mean? Like Frank showed me tons of stuff, but I was like, dude, listen to Oasis, dude. I was like, I know you have preconceived notions about Oasis. Listen to the deep cuts. You know what I mean? Same thing with Blur. I was like, it's not boys and girls, man. It's like, listen to the deep cuts. And, and you know, yeah, it was just, it was a fun experience um, sharing music in that way where it was like physical discs passed around the, passed around the van. You lose them. They're covered in coffee. I remember that. I remember like, just like stuff would be everywhere. And you'd be like, oh man, where's my Weezer Blue album? Oh, I gotta oh, buy God. a new one. Yeah, I gotta buy a new one. It's trashed. You know what I mean? <laughs> Trying to find a copy of the Blue album on the road. That's a nightmare. You don't want to be in that situation. Gotta have it all times, right? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. In case of emergency, Blue album. <laughs> Yeah, behind glass at all times. Make sure, just in case. Um, speaking of which, I want to mention, of course, uh, Ray is behind the production desk on a lot of this, yeah. which is very, very interesting. What's that working relationship like for him? I mean, I mean, obviously, such a great talent, and he's definitely moved a lot more in these last few years into a lot of engineering stuff and a lot of production yeah. stuff. Um, yeah, how was that experience working alongside him? I mean, I mean, Ray's one of those. He's just a brilliant music mind. You know what I mean? He's uh, he hears people he hears things differently than maybe other people do. You know, he's like a, he's a scientist with it. Um, what, what I was kind of describing it as when somebody asked a similar question, I was like, I think everyone in my chemical romance at one point or another wore the producer hat in the studio and some, you know, we'd all tag in and out, but Ray, Gerard, Frank, anyone, they jumped in that producer realm for however long it was at any given time. And it's like, I saw that out of Ray, when we were making my cam and you know when we were demoing in the bus you know like on the road he would have his rig and we'd all be like so it kind of came it always came natural to him you know he was always he was always fascinated with with the production side of things and he would always study what the engineers were doing when we would make albums uh but yeah it was it was very seamless i had seen it before i'd seen that look in his eyes before um but we also we, we share like this other language from working with each other for so long. You know, we kind of like, I know what he likes, he knows what I like. And sometimes I can just give him a look and he knows what I'm talking about. You know, or we'll, we'll point to something, we'll point to something invisible in the air and he'll just be like, oh, click. You know what I mean? It's just, we share, we share this other language, you know? So I felt like I was just astounded by what he did. You know, he transformed these songs. It's got to be lovely when you're trying something a bit more ambitious as well to have someone like that that you've known for so long. I mean, it's it's an instant confidence, right? I was I was itching to work with him when uh, I was itching to work with him when when we were talking about this album. 
Yeah. And I remember Dave just asking questions. He wasn't against the idea, but he was just like, what's, what's Ray done? You know, like what, what does this stuff sound like? I'm like, have you heard, have you heard my chemical romance? You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying he produced it. I'm saying like our DNA is all over that stuff. You know what I mean? It's like, um, that's our resume. You know what I mean? So I was always like, you don't have to worry about what he's done. You know what I mean? Like, trust me, the dude can do it. You know what I mean? And it was like, um, and Dave was floored, you know, Dave was like, you were right. You know, not that he was against it again, but he was just like, you were right. He was like, yeah. dude's a genius. He's like, I only want to work with him. You know what I mean? And it's like, he knows what he's doing, man. Yeah. You know? Can't ask for anything more there. Can't ask for anything yeah. more. And in terms of uh, the other side of it, you know, of course, we mentioned the graphic novel, not your first foray into this area. Of course, I wanted to kind of ask a little bit yeah. about Collapser and see how how you learned from that. Obviously, working, working with Sean as well on that project. So what was that relationship like before? What did you learn from doing that the first time around? And, uh, and yeah, letting that collaboration grow too. Sean Simon is someone who, one of my best friends in the world, but like, my first my chem my chemical romance memory is tied to him oh really we we played our first show in garfield new jersey at a vfw hall and i it's no secret i i have stage fright you know not not so much anymore but in the beginning i was like oh my god oh my god like the thought of playing in front of an audience kind of frightened me and in the beginning i masked it through alcohol which you know catches up with you at some point but i remember being in the van with him, um, we were about to go on. Pensy Prep was closing the show. He was in Pensy Prep. He was the keyboardist with Frank. Uh, but I remember him just being like, he found like there was like a, a bag of like chips and it had a sticker on it that said sandwich partner. Like, you know, the, you're supposed to buy this with the sandwich, but he took, he took the sticker off and he put it on me and he goes, you're my sandwich partner, man. And I was like, that stuck, that stuck with me to this day, you know, like, that's my earliest my chem memory with Sean Simon being like, you got this, dude. What are you afraid of? You know what I mean? And it's like, flash forward, you know, we're writing Collapser. You know, we, we had always, we'd always traded, like, you know, we bring graphic novels on the road, like comic books. And, you know, I would show him stuff. He would show me stuff. I and mean, we would always talk about um, writing, like, a story together someday. And it just never, it never lined up until, um, I was talking to DC about writing a comic book and they were like, Hey, you should, you should really um, co-write it with somebody so you can figure it out as you're going. Everyone kind of does that. Their first, their first comic is usually co-written, you know? Um, he was the first name that jumped in my mind. He's like, you know, he, he had gone off after, after Pensy Prep, he'd gone off to be a comic book writer and he's, a, he's amazing. You know what I mean? And he's gone on, he's prolific. He's got lots of comics out. Um, but he, he was the first name that jumped to mind. And he, he taught me how to, he taught me how to write a comic book, you know, open that word document. I'll tell you what to do. I'll, I'll teach you. And then before you knew it, I was doing it myself. You know what I mean? If we would divvy up like, all right, you want that scene? I got this scene. We would map out the, the issues, but yeah, he, he very much, he very much taught me how to panel, you know, paneling's hard. It's oh, yeah. like directing a movie, you know, you gotta be like, all right, uh, you know, above shot of blah, blah, blah. You know, you see this, you know, his jacket's this color, like they're in a room that's kind of like that. You have to spell it all out. So getting to learn that language, he taught me how to, how to use that language. Um, and you know, it's, it's gonna be, it's gonna be, uh, you know, things I use for the rest of my life, you know, cause I'm always gonna write comic books. But yeah, Sean Simon forever linked to, uh, to me and uh, you know, my brother as well. My brother has written scores of comic books with him killjoys and you know it's like it's it's really cool that sean's just he's he's been there with me and my brother through a lot of stuff yeah it's really cool what a great creative collaborator to have especially on a project like this one and and again looking forward you know you mentioned not stopping writing comics i guess what's kind of going to be next for you is uh this anthrax project again with your brother actually tell me a little bit about that because that's i i love the idea of almost adapting an album in that way that's that's been around for a while right yeah, Z two's doing spectacular stuff with. Have you looked at what they're coming? Oh out yeah, with? no, I've seen some really really cool stuff from them. It's very. Oh, no, every, every day I refresh my page and I'm like, yeah, you know, Z two got them. Z two. Yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah. All these artists working with them, it's cool. Elvis Presley and and 
and Jim Morrison, The Doors, and Grateful Dead, and Sublime, I think, is coming out. And it's like they're they're doing really awesome stuff because you know uh, music's always been very visual and 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 it's very you know there's there's stories to be told on these songs and it's like it was always itching to to be tied to comics that tightly you know i mean you think back to the old kiss comic books you know what i mean and like then in the 90s there were a lot of rock comic books and but now i feel like i feel like the marriage of the two has been perfected you know what i mean so z2 is just doing awesome stuff with that um, but yeah anthrax i mean growing up me and my brother saturday night headbangers ball on mtv and one of the bands that that hit us was anthrax you know like the the comic book they they were doing the comic book industry I, I, imagery back then you know what i mean like they had the judge dread and the not man and you know all their merch was them as like comic book characters and like you know they were they were super ahead of the curve with that stuff you know what i mean so they were one of the bands that we really loved and and you know and they knew we were fans of them and when when the when it came about to write this this uh this anniversary edition they they reached out to me and Gerard and were like would you, you know would you guys want to write something and yeah. we were like uh yes so, yeah. <laughs> um yes we would yeah it's being done right now um but yeah dream come true love anthrax you know yeah Really, really cool project to be a part of, man. Really cool project. A uh, couple more questions before I let you go. Uh, one thing I did want to mention, just because we've not chatted in quite a while, and uh, there's, there's something that I wanted to ask you about that kind of took place a little while back now, but obviously we're big fans of water parks over here at Rock Sound, you know, a band that we've covered a long, long time. Just a little about that relationship, because it was always such a joy getting to see you join those guys on stage and really adding a little extra piece to that live show. Um, yeah, just tell me a little bit about, I guess, how that ended up happening in the first place and, and, and working with those guys on on their music yeah uh benji madden had hit me up 2014 i guess it was maybe 2015 and he goes hey what do you think of this and he sends it to me and it was the it was demos of what became the ep the cluster ep and i knew you know what i mean you know when you know when you hear something and you know you know what i'm talking about you know i heard it and i was like they know how to write songs. Their DNA on that EP on that EP is like the DNA of the band. They know how to write a song. You know what I mean? And the the intelligent vocal melodies, the the intricate instrumentation, um, it was all there. Even in a that was a, a more crude form of water parks as as to what they become. But um, I knew I knew everyone knows that that listened to it back then. You know what I mean? And the Maddens found them very early. You know, that's, that was to me, like they, they're the future of that genre. You know what I mean? They, they're the, they're going to be the, they're going to be the torch bearers. That's the way I feel, you know, and I've heard the new album and I, and I know it, you know what I mean? Like it's just going to keep happening for them. You know, like uh, the, the work ethic of that band, um, the vision, everything means something, you know, if it's the font, if it's the shirt they're wearing, if it's the color of the hair, if it's a picture in the background on the wall, like everything is thought out with that band. And it, and it made me, it made me think back when I was Austin's age, you know what I mean? And, you know, eating and, and breathing and sleeping my chemical romance. And that's what he does with the water parks. You know what I mean? It's like, he, he tirelessly works on it. He doesn't stop thinking about it. And I respected that, you know, and, and I want to see them succeed. They've already succeeded, but I want to see them to, I want to see them keep breaking that, breaking that ceiling every time. And they do. And I know that this new album, it's going to be the same thing. They're going to keep breaking the ceiling. And when, when anyone counts you out in that position, you prove them wrong. You know what I mean? We, you know, we did it in our career where people were like pigeonhole, pigeonhole, paint you in a corner and it's like you turn left when people think you're going to turn right and then they can't catch you you know that's kind of what i see in that band yeah good advice and definitely wise words now very exciting to hear what's coming next from them and in terms of yourself uh you know well obviously the record's about to come out we mentioned live shows there still obviously to make the live debut is that something you've thought about in terms of i know you must have seen everyone doing all the live stream things and everything have you you and david kind of talked about how that might work potentially 
what, what's interesting was before before the pandemic happened, we were supposed to have a really big San Diego Comic Con thing. And we were possibly going to play the first ever Electric Century show at Comic Con. Co that's so perfect. That would have been amazing. Oh, wow. And it didn't happen. Uh, but what I was saying before is this is a very pandemic project. It's like, well, now you can do something like that. And it's normal. Two years ago, if you were like, hey, I want to stream this show, people would look at you funny. You know what I mean? Now it's like, hey, you guys going to stream a show? Almost like what we're doing right now. We're on Zoom. It's like two years ago, this was all foreign to all of us. That was a webcam, you know? Like what kind of what kind of funny business are you doing on that webcam? You know what I mean? It's like now, now it's part of communication. You know what I mean? Yeah. This this was a way for family members to also keep in touch when they were vast distances. But now it's 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 taken the place of of offices. You know what I mean? Yeah, I have friends. For sure. I have friends that have still never gone back to an office place. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, it changed the game and it, and it changed the way, you know, you're watching bands do exciting live streams now. Um, you know, like uh, what Thursday and under oath did these oh, huge so good. cinematic. They look amazing and other bands are doing it too, you know? Um, but me and Dave are talking about possibly doing a stream because it's the perfect way to do this project, especially, with streams, you can control the visuals. You know what I mean? You can control, you control everything about it. Instead of, you know, when you're watching a show, a couple places you can look with this, you can, you can divert the camera somewhere. You could show people something you want to see. It makes it, you can make it pretty cinematic, I think. And I think, I think that's what Electric Century lends to, you know what I mean? Yeah, the possibilities are endless, man. Well, I mean, in the meantime, dude, I mean, the record's great. Congratulations and, you know, best of luck with the lease and everything. And we just look forward to seeing you in the UK whenever that may be, sooner rather than later, we hope. Fingers crossed. Yeah, uh, fingers, crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed, man. But in the meantime, yeah, just take care of yourself and uh, we'll you chat too. to you again soon, all right? Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks.